Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time I covered Sherman's actions during the Mexican-American War. Now we move with him to the East and his marriage with Ellen. The trip aboard the Oregon only took him 30 days to get to New York by crossing the Isthmus of Panama instead of going around the tip of South America. In New York City, he took a carriage to Ninth Street, where Winfield Scott, the General-in-Chief of the Army, had his office. Scott gained his fame in the War of 1812, but the Mexican War brought him even more glory. That night, Sherman had dinner with Scott, which must have been an awestruck experience for the young officer. The two discussed the Mexican War in depth, and Scott tested Sherman's knowledge, Scott himself being a fan of fine literature. During the dinner, Scott said that he believed the country was fast approaching a civil war. Sherman couldn't believe what the general was saying. Sherman also expressed his worries that his lack of combat had ruined his chances of rising up in the military, but Scott assured him that he shouldn't worry about it. He then sent Sherman to Washington to inform the Secretary of War, George Crawford, about the situation in California. In Washington, D.C., Sherman found Crawford to be uninterested in California, aside from it becoming a slave state. Sherman would get a six-month leave of absence, and he would spend it in Washington, attempting to tout his abilities as an officer and receive some kind of promotion. Also, the Ewings had moved to Washington, D.C. because Thomas Ewing had become the first Secretary of the Interior. Sherman arrived unannounced to surprise Ellen, who was given her canary a bath when he came calling. They were still at an impasse when it came to Sherman's career, his religion, and his residence. She wanted him to resign his commission, move to Lancaster, Ohio, and become a devout Catholic. This would be a constant debate during Sherman's six-month leave. He met with the adjutant general, complaining that as an adjutant to both Mason and Smith, that he hadn't received pay commensurate that of an adjutant, and that a promotion was not forthcoming after having performed such adjutant duties. Sherman knew that Congress was debating a bill to create four new commissary captaincies and basically asked the adjutant general for one of those positions. During this leave, Sherman traveled to Ohio and spent time with his mother and his brother John. The impasse with Ellen seems to have resulted in Sherman neglecting his wedding. One of Sherman's biographers wrote that Sherman's letters to her were hardly tender. He remained businesslike about his expressions of affection, and even his warmest words were lacking in passion. He told Ellen that he was prepared to assume the high trust of your guardian and master. I will not promise to be the kindest hearted loving man in the world, nor will I profess myself a bluebird. All I believe is that if health be given us, and that love and mutual confidence, which I trust we both deeply feel continue, we stand as fair a chance for a slight share of worldly contentment and happiness as any other couple. You shall be my adjutant and chief counselor, and I'll show you how to steer clear of the real and imaginary troubles of this world. Only be contented, happy, and repose proper trust in me, and I think when the time comes for us to part, which I hope will be many a year hence, you will look back upon a fair and goodly prospect. At all events, let us live in that hope. Ellen would be his comrade in life, as his fellow officers were his comrades in arms, and he would expect her to accept him as they did. Sherman chose the day they would wed, May 1st, because he said that he always loved to see the flowers bloom and the spring day would cheer them on their way into their marriage. However, he asked her to wait until August, when his leave ended, for him to make the decision whether to leave or stay in the army. Also during this time, he sent his sister Elizabeth $1,500 to help stabilize her life because her alcoholic husband was squandering their money away in alcohol and bad business ventures. The money Sherman sent to Elizabeth was no different. Her husband lost it in investments. When Sherman visited the family in Philadelphia, he found the children on the verge of starvation. He tried to help them as much as he could, but he felt somewhat powerless. All of the stress from his future wife and his sister resulted in what Sherman called Mexican diarrhea that began to plague him at this time. Although he believed he had brought some intestinal problems back from California, he thought he might be unfit for marriage when his physical problems worsened, but a doctor told him he needed proper diet and exercise and that the wedding could go on as scheduled. On May 1st, Sherman and Ellen were married in the Blair House, much to the consternation of Ellen and her mother, who wanted to be married in a Catholic church, but the non-religious Sherman would not have it. However, a Jesuit priest did marry them. Sherman was in full military uniform during the ceremony, which signaled to Ellen that she would not be marrying a civilian. The wedding was a big social event, with more than 300 guests. 
including President Zachary Taylor, his cabinet, Supreme Court justices, and prominent politicians, including Henry Clay, who gave Ellen a bouquet holder to use in the ceremony. Ellen became so excited that during the receiving line, she kissed the president. For their honeymoon, they spent time in Philadelphia, investing in a soap and candle business in the interest of Sherman's sister Elizabeth, in order for her to have some kind of income from the profits. They then went through New York State, where Sherman excitedly showed Ellen West Point. After visiting Niagara Falls, they spent nearly a month in Lancaster. By July, they were back in Washington, taking part in the 4th of July celebrations along with the president. When the president suddenly died a few days later, Sherman was in attendance in the Senate gallery to watch Vice President Millard Fillmore take the oath of office and become president of the United States. Sherman also served as a mounted aide to the adjutant general during the funeral service for President Taylor. Washington, D.C. in 1850 was a critical time politically. The president had died in office, the vice president had assumed that role, and now the Senate debated a critical piece of legislation, the Compromise of 1850. Among the topics were whether the selling and buying of slaves should be allowed in Washington, D.C. Sherman sat in the Senate gallery watching these debates take place. He became so interested in the debates that Ellen insinuated that Sherman would be happier resigning his commission and entering politics. During the debates, talk of secession and civil war meandered its way through the proceedings. At one point, Henry Clay, the great Whig orator and personal favorite of Sherman, said, I love Kentucky with all my heart and all my soul, but if Kentucky were to secede, I would shoulder my old musket and be among the first to put her down, down, down. With the political reshuffling going on because of the president's death, Senator Daniel Webster would take on the role of Secretary of State. Before leaving the Senate, he was to make one final speech. The crowd gathered, watching intently in the Senate gallery. Sherman tried to get there early in order to find a seat, but was unable to. However, he did convince someone to let him sit on the Senate floor. He did so with Winfield Scott right behind Webster. Once the speech ended, Sherman was unimpressed with Webster. He was much more impressed and enjoyed the speeches of Henry Clay. When California did enter the Union, Sherman was happy to say that he witnessed nearly every step of California's admission into the Union. He had been one of the first Americans into California during the Mexican-American War, witnessed its Constitutional Convention, and then watched as Congress pass the bill making it a state. At the end of his furlough, Sherman was assigned to the 3rd Artillery, now stationed at Jefferson Barracks in Missouri. Ellen would stay home in Lancaster. When he arrived at Jefferson Barracks, he was greeted by old friends. Among those was Braxton Bragg. He had become somewhat of a hero during the war and was now a company commander. At Jefferson Barracks, there was constant talk about the war and the great deeds and accolades bestowed upon the soldiers who fought in it. One night, Sherman awoke in an asthma attack and fell into a depression, believing that his lack of combat experience was ruining any chance he had at being promoted. However, he would soon find out that he would be named one of the new commissary captains. Because of his new rank and position, he had to be relocated a little ways away to St. Louis to be close to the supplies that his commissary department would need. By Christmas, he returned to Lancaster to spend the holiday season with Ellen. She emphatically told him that she would not be going west with him if he was called to go to Oregon or another far-flung state so far away from home. Sherman returned to St. Louis and on January 28, 1851, Ellen gave birth to their first child, a girl they named Maria after Ellen's mother, but the family would always call her Minnie. In March, Sherman returned to Ohio and brought Ellen and the baby to St. Louis, much to the consternation of Ellen. They first stayed in the planter's hotel, but when Ellen found it too confining, Sherman bought him and his family a little house just a few short minutes from his office. Ellen particularly liked the large guest room, and she invited her family to come stay for as long as they liked, hoping to keep some semblance of home in a faraway city. Over the next year, Ellen, Sherman, and Minnie, along with their three servants, lived in the home, but then Sherman's West Point friend, Stuart Van Vliet, and his wife moved in to share the expenses. During this time, Sherman kept his distance from Minnie, saying that she was like a thousand other babies. This is most likely due to the fact that Sherman feared Ellen would move back to Lancaster with Minnie, and he didn't want to become too distraught over the thought of losing a child. In 1851, one of Thomas Ewing's cousins won a litigation involving allegedly one of the largest land decisions in American history. With Sherman being a part of the Ewing family, he was given access to this land and purchased large tracts of property. Ewing authorized Sherman to buy $2,000 worth of city land for Ellen. 
Sherman began to get restless. The life of a commissary captain was lots of tedious paperwork and didn't fulfill what he wanted to do. He was hoping he would be sent anywhere, particularly Oregon, where he believed he could get active service. In May 1852, Sherman was sent on a temporary assignment to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and Ellen and Minnie went back to Lancaster. Sherman sold his house since now he would be alone without his wife and child. The separation irritated him, and he talked of weaning Ellen away from her parents. To add to his misery, his mother passed away around this same time. In New Orleans, when a scheme to profit off the army was uncovered, where two army commissary officers avoided competitive bidding for army supplies and only did business with one company, to which they both had ties, the army replaced them. The army sent Sherman to sort out the mess. Sherman set up his headquarters and began rearranging the department. The owner of the company that was getting all of the army business attempted to persuade Sherman to keep up the former arrangement, but Sherman refused. He was so thorough, one officer stated, if Sherman does not find the error of three cents necessary to balance his accounts, he will resign his commission and commit suicide. While in New Orleans, Sherman visited operas, theaters, and the Battle of New Orleans battle site, but he found the location planted in sugarcane and the marker in a ditch. In November 1852, Ellen gave birth to their second child, another girl they named Mary Elizabeth after Sherman's mother and sister. Sherman would call her Lizzie. By late December, Ellen and the two girls were with Sherman in New Orleans. Sherman was thrilled to have his now larger family with him, but an opportunity arose. A friend named Henry S. Turner wrote to Sherman and expressed his confidence that the skills Sherman learned as the commissary captain in St. Louis and New Orleans had prepared him for a job in finance. He wanted him to operate a bank in California. Sherman didn't want to leave the army, but the army pay wasn't enough to live the way he wanted to. So he was given a six month leave of absence. He would use that time to travel to San Francisco and see if he liked the banking life. He sent Ellen and the children back to Lancaster and he set sail for California and possibly a new career. 